we are really honored to have the opportunity to have you here today. Katarina will say a few organizational things and then the floor will be yours. Thank you, Hannah, for the introduction. And uh, so today the meeting uh, will last about an hour or Margaret's lecture. During the seminar, you are very welcome to ask any questions. Uh, just write it uh, in the chat box. And at the end of uh, this meeting, we or Margaret will try to answer your questions and you are very welcome to join the discussion at the end of this seminar. Uh, also, I want to mention that this meeting is being recorded and later we will publish it online on some Czech and Moravia Society websites, probably to YouTube channel. And uh, I want to ask you to uh, turn off the camera because there it will probably we will have better connection. And I think from the organization point of view, it's all and uh, so, Margaret, it is all yours. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you, Katarina and Hannah, for inviting me. And thanks to others at the Czech and Moravian Psychological Society um, for asking me to speak. Um, I'm going to give you a talk today about single case studies. And this is based on a course um, that I taught at Harvard uh, for many years to undergraduates there. And it's also based on um, my early research in the area of amnesia, when I worked for many years with someone named um, Laird Cermak. Um, and um, as part of that work, we did a number of lesion analytic studies with individual patients to look at patterns of memory loss in relation to different lesions in different parts of the brain. Um, and I am going to try to advance my slides. And oh, there we go. Um, we're now in a world of big data and we're being asked to do large scale meta-analytic studies of autobiographical memory, all sorts of different things. So this is kind of an old fashioned talk. And what I'm trying to do is make the case for you that looking closely at the patient in front of you, as a clinician, really considering carefully what patients are telling you and what they look like um, as, you taste, uh, as you test them um, in order to understand the brain better. And I'm asking the question, and I hope you will entertain this thought, whether single case studies are still worthwhile or are they, what Tim Shalas said in an article back in 2014, are they the dodo birds of cognitive um, neuropsychology? Meaning, are they obsolete? So I'm going to make the case for you um, that the pro-dodo argument, and that would be people who would say single case studies are obsolete, would say, when you look at an individual pa patient, you're not really averaging data, you're losing a lot of information. What they would say is that lesion analytic approach is old fashioned, it's messy. They have a preference for large scale studies with big data sets. They would say that single patients may be unusual and that the findings that you see in one person may not generalize to a larger group. There's a lack of statistical power, and you might be at risk for false positive errors. And the other thing about single case studies, and all these are faults, all these are limitations, but they do not allow for refutation. You can't actually disagree with what a patient who has been described for you. The anti-dodo argument, as I'm calling it, those, that would be me, that would be people who are in favor of single case studies, would say that some patients are unique and what you observe in front of you may inform your cognitive and neural theory about how the brain works. You may see unexpected behaviors that lead to new ideas. And that was true for some of the studies that I have done. You'll see a single case patient has led me to explore 
an idea with a larger group of patients. And also, when you average data, when you put data together from a lot of different patients, you may dilute or obscure findings. The other things, and I hope you will see this today in some of the cases that I described for you, when you take a long view, you may see events unfold over time. And when you're seeing someone up close, you have a bird's eye view. So you have close scrutiny of cognitive processes. Single case studies, and now I'm gonna to try to go back, there we go, um, ha, um, have been um, praised um, by our colleagues in the field of neuro, neuropsychiatry in an article that was in the Journal of Neuropsychiatry and Clinical Neurosciences in 2018. Um, and they encouraged people in their organization to consider these six cases as essential to their understanding of how the brain works. It's a very good article, and I can pass it on to Hannah if, if anyone in this room wants it. Um, it's also the case that our colleague um, from the British Isle, Sarah McPherson, has written a really marvelous book about amnesic, about single case patients um, and profiles of amnesia that she and Sergio Della Sala and others have observed. Today, I'm going to tell you about five patients who I have examined up close and who have led me to understand how memory works in the brain. I'm going to start with patient SS, who was the first patient who I studied, and that's a very straightforward case. And then we'll talk about a patient LD who had a disproportionate retrograde amnesia. What I mean by that is that most people don't have retrograde amnesia in the absence of a very severe anterograde amnesia. This young woman did, and we'll talk about her. We'll talk about patient JT, who was a case of accelerated forgetting. He showed that his, he could hold information for a period of time and then lose it over the course of weeks and months in the context of epilepsy. We'll talk about patient GS, who taught me a lot about how frontal neural systems and source monitoring are the underpinnings of confabulation. And finally, we'll talk about a, a woman who had cat grass syndrome. Um, and I saw her when she was amnesic, I saw her before and after the genesis of cat grass syndrome. Okay, so we'll start with patient um, SS. And if I'm not clear and you want further information, please let me know. So this is the first patient um, who I saw, and now you see how very old I am, because this was published back in 1983. Um, and this was a 50-year-old man who had his PhD in physics and who was a, a very prolific researcher. And he developed herpes simplex encephalitis back in 1973. Um, and he retained, and you can see the lesions in his scan here, both lateral and mesial temporal lobe lesions. It's a very, very um, dramatic uh, brain scan. So here's a man with this brain scan who still had superior intellectual abilities versus a very, very dense anterior grain amnesia. He also had a severe anterograde amnesia. We studied him with all sorts of tasks. We looked at, at the time, we were interested in whether different levels of processing affected memory. We were interested in the boundaries of working memory. SS, because of his high intelligence, uh, was a very interesting um, man um, to study, and, and we followed him for years, including studies looking at his personality development over time. What we learned from SS is that he had superior semantic analytic abilities. His language functions were at the 99th percentile and superior working memory, but that did not in any way enhance retention of, of new events, even with cues. Now that may sound like something you know very well, but in 1983, we did not know that. So it was kind of an interesting finding. Um, we learned from SS that to have a marked retrograde amnesia, he could not remember his wedding. He could not remember information that went back 20 years or so, um, that you needed large lesions 
involving lateral temporal cortices. We also found that SS had somewhat of a preservation of personal semantics. And so when I say that, when we think about autobiographical memory, we think about subcomponents. One is your episodic autobiographical memory, your, your memory for some specific event that happened to you. And the other is those overlearned facts that you know about yourself that are still part of your personal memory, but they're devoid of the space and time um, parameters that episodic memory has. And SS taught us a great deal about that. And the fact that his knowledge of that he had been a physicist, that he had gone to a specific academic institution, that he had children named X, Y, and Z, was consistent with the idea that some aspects of uh, personal memory remained intact, even for dense amnesic patients. And we did many, many, many studies of implicit memory for, with SS, looking at rotor pursuit, STEM completion, all sorts of implicit memory paradigms. Again, none of this is groundbreaking to you all, but back in the day, way back then, we learned a great deal um, from him. Um, after SS, the next patient that really caught my eye as, as incredibly um, unique um, was a patient who we called LD. And I described this case again with Laird Cermak, who was my mentor at the time, and Nelson Butters. Um, and this was a 26-year-old high school graduate who developed herpes simplex encephalitis in 1981. And you all know that herpes simplex, just like SS's case, has the proclivity for affecting the hippocampus and other temporal cortices. So early on in her course of recovery, she was aphasic, she was prosopagnosic, she was agnosic, and she was amnestic. She recovered fairly well to the extent that she was able to live alone. She was taking a course in programming when I saw her, and she worked as a cashier, which is all to say that her new learning capacity, her anterograde memory, was relatively intact. Her verbal abilities, and you can see here from her CT scan that she had marked um, uh, sort of lesions in, in the right temporal uh, lobe. Um, you, you, can, you can also see here that there was a real um, difference between her verbal IQ and her performance IQ, consistent with the asymmetry of her lesion affecting more right mesial and lateral temporal cortices more than left. In conjunction with that, she had what we consider a material specific amnesia, meaning that her memory for stories, this is logical memory stories, was much better than her memory for designs, that's visual reproduction, um, and her memory for words on the Warrington recognition memory test was much better than her memory for faces. So I've told you already that she was prosopagnosic. What I haven't told you is that she also had impaired imagery. And that's key to understanding the nature of her retrograde memory problem. She had a very severe impairment. She had no recollection of childhood friends, of events from grammar school, of her prom, of her high school prom, or her graduation. So that, that's quite striking because in most instances, when someone has a retrograde memory impairment, they have equal or more anterograde. She did not. And so here's the type of tests that we did with her. her. This is a modified version of Michael Koppelman's autobiographical memory interview. We compared LD to her brother PD, who was her, the same age as her. And we asked her a variety of questions. For instance, sorry, I need to go back here. Um, what was your first memory? And LD said she couldn't think of anything, whereas PD had a very well articulated memory from childhood, putting tea bags on the floor. He was in diapers. We asked her what she did during the first few years at school. She came up short. She could not remember anything. 
whereas PD was able to describe an event of biting into a biscuit and losing his tooth when he was about six or seven. And we did many, many other, asked her many other questions, and it was routinely this difference between her and PD in that she was unable to retrieve memories, whereas he was. Another study that we did with her was a popular autobiographical memory paradigm at the time, which many of us used, and it was called the Krobitz Free Association Paradigm. And in order to, order to generate autobiographical memories, we would give someone a specific word and we would ask them, <coughs> excuse me, to come up with a detailed memory for that particular word. So for LD, we gave the word hurt. She said, ah, I remember I had braces that hurt. She didn't remember a specific event. So she had a specific, she had a semantic memory for her past, but nothing truly episodic. PD, her brother, on the other hand, remembered that he was three, he was standing on a chair, his feet slipped and he hit his chin, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to go into all the details, but just to tell you that we did, we gave her many, many words to generate episodic memories and she didn't have any. So as we thought about her, we thought about the role of visual imagery in autobiographical memory. And I'm just gonna show you here, um, um, when LD was asked to draw a flower um, from memory, this is what she drew. Versus her ability to copy a flower, you can see that it's very good, which underscores the fact that she was not able to really imagine things well. And we came to the conclusion, and this is well before others had, you know, this is, you know, way, way many years ago. Here she is trying to draw a house from memory versus copying a house. We came to the conclusion that LD probably had a real problem with autobiographical memory because she had a visual memory impairment. And one might imagine that vision, that your ability to conjure up a memory really is the cement, it's the glue, it's the template that you need in order to retrieve it. So what did we learn from this particular patient? We learned that anterior grade amnesia and retrograde amnesia are independent, that they're not always linked. Contrary to popular opinion, you can have more retrograde amnesia in the absence of an anterior grade amnesia. And we learned that within the construct of retrograde amnesia, one might have intact personal memories, personal semantics, but not, not be able to reconstruct episodes. And as I just told you, it suggested the role of visual imagery as a template for organizing autobiographical memory. So I didn't hear much about this for many years. It was a patient I had seen and I sort of let, uh, let it go. But recently, or a couple of years ago, I started reading about the syndrome of aphantasia. Fantasia is a Greek term for imagination. And there are people who have reduced capacity for imagery. This has been well described by Zeman and Della Sala. And they perform poorly on tests of uh, vividness of visual imagery. And what they've found is that there's an association between lack of imagery and developmental prosopagnosia. And I told you LD had prosopagnosia. So that caught my interest. But what really caught my interest was a study in 2018 of the link between aphantasia and severely deficient autobiographical memory, which makes the case with a larger group of people, what I had observed in LD so many years ago and what, what we had said about LD. And so it just, it, you know, again, it underscored for me the value of paying close attention to the patients who you're working with. So now I'm gonna talk about a third patient who taught me something completely different um, about memory. And this was a patient who, when I went to work at Beth Israel Deaconess so many years ago, Marcel Meslam um, was um, my, my boss and, and my mentor. And when I interviewed with him, he said, I have a patient who has a retrograde amnesia and doesn't have an anterograde amnesia. Do you want to see this patient? 
And of course I said, sure, uh, sure, I'll see him. And this was a 42 year old man who had a very atypical amnesia. He remembered everything that went on during the day. He could tell you about his drive to, to the testing situation, who he had spoken with, what music he listened to, what he ate for breakfast. But what he did not recall was information from two weeks prior. He didn't remember, for instance, that he had gone on a two week trip to Florida a month before he saw me. He didn't remember anything about that trip. He did not remember the ages and grades of his kids, that his uncle had died 20 years prior. He couldn't remember his high school graduation, his first car, his father-in-law, he was very close with, with his father-in-law. So he had major gaps in his retrograde memory, which is why at first we thought, well, okay, maybe he's like patient LD. Maybe he has a retrograde amnesia, but he can learn new things. What was true for him is that he would learn new things, but he wouldn't keep them. They degraded at a faster rate um, than other people. And so we described him as a case of accelerated forgetting. And this is what his neuropsychological profile looked like. And because we're a little bit short on time, I'm not gonna go into details, but we'll answer questions, which is all to say here that everything was normal in terms of his IQ, his attention tests on the trails, on the Wisconsin, his language functions were normal, his working memory on the Brown-Peterson test was normal, and his new learning was absolutely fine. His delayed memory index was at the 84th percentile. So this is not someone like SS. This is not a classic amnesic patient, but I told you already about the density of his retrograde memory problem. What I didn't tell you is that as he got worked up in our clinical unit, we found that he was having bitemporal epileptiform activity that was subclinical, and he was having 20 to 30 seizures a day. And he had some um, mild anterior temporal lobe atrophy with some uh, ventricular dilation. And they discovered three years after we saw him that he had a testicular mass um, cancerous um, lesion, and he was diagnosed with something called perineoplastic encephalitis. But from a strictly cognitive standpoint, what was most interesting about patient JT was the way that his memory changed over the course of a week. So we also you, um, asked one of his siblings to participate as the control in this study. So this is patient JT in the white boxes. And you can see that over the course of the week, he loses information um, quite dramatically. But you see, here he is. He's given a, a list of 10 words. Two hours after learning the 10 words, he knew all 10 words. You don't see that with amnesic patients. Um, and here's patient PT. He's not patient, but his brother PT and what PT looked like over the course of the week in terms of the 10 words. After a week, he still knew eight of the 10 words. They had both been rehearsed many times up front. But you'll see when he had two seizures. So this is just clinically observed seizures. This is not the, all the subclinical seizures. This is just what we saw when he had two seizures. You can see how his memory sort of decayed over time, which led us to conclude um, that seizures were disrupting the process of consolidation uh, for patient JT. And we looked at him uh, when he was on a very potent anticonvulsant medication. He was brought into the hospital. He was put on peraldehyde. And so the peraldehyde trial is this line here. You can see that when his seizures were under better control, that he retained more information, which again for us affirmed our idea that seizures had a deleterious effect on his retention of information over the course of time. Again, this was a clinical observation. I'm a clinical neuropsychologist. There weren't studies as there are now, I'll show you in a minute, there are many studies now on the association between seizures and accelerated forgetting. There were no studies like that. It was just us looking at this single patient. If he had been part of a group, we never would have seen it. So what JT taught us is that there's an unusual pattern of memory loss. 
he taught us about the association between epilepsy and a fixed tissue injury. He also had, had a lesion. And that he taught us that consolidation is a process that take, play, takes place over a longer period of time. He may have retention for some information over a day or so, and then it, it's disrupted prior to it being securely represented in the neocortex. And he taught us, and this was before Narendra Kapoor talked about um, transient epileptic amnesia, but he taught us about the effect of transient epileptic amnesia on long-term forgetting before we even knew that there was such a syndrome. Um, and it's relevant to dementia because now people are looking at the effects of physiological disturbances in memory problems in people who have Alzheimer's disease. And this is just a slide to show you that there are, have been many studies um, of um, accelerated forgetting in the context of epilepsy. So it's, not, it's just not my sort of thought. But as I said earlier, sometimes this led me to go off in different directions. So I began to look at the effects of electroshock therapy on rate of forgetting. Um, and no big surprise, um, what I found is that both with a test that I developed called the transient news events test, um, I found that ECT had an effect on both new learning um, with the Ray Auditory Verbal Learning Test, with the a list learning test, but that this rebounds after someone recovers from, from um, ECT, whereas memory for remote events do not. And this is just a slide showing you, I compared ECT patients with patients having transcranial magnetic stimulation, and you'll see at the end of treatment, and of course, people who have bilateral electrodes perform worse than others, um, their memory for a word list was quite poor, but then two weeks later, it was much better than it had been to begin with. And that's generally what we see with ECT. Um, whereas the, the um, transient news items, the news items test that I developed, you can see that people with TMS got better over time because it was the same set of items versus patients who had ECT showed that same drip dip right at the end of treatment, but they never fully recovered. So rather than showing the practice effect of repeated exposure to news items, ECT patients looked worse. Uh, I'm not going to go into great detail, uh, more detail, maybe if we have time, of other ECT studies, because I want to tell you about the last two patients. They're interesting, um, at least they are, have been to me. So patient GS is a patient who I described with Marsha Johnson back in 1997, and this was a patient who was confabulatory. And we know, you know this from your clinical work, that when someone is confabulating, it's usually the convergence of two factors. One is a little bit of a memory problem, and then some executive, some source monitoring problems. But we know that not all people with executive deficits, not all people who have frontal lobe damage confabulate. And we also know that people who have just amnesia and they don't have any frontal lobe involvement don't confabulate. For instance, patient SS never confabulated. He was densely amnesic, but he did not make things up. So in this particular study, we became very interested in the cognitive underpinnings of confabulation, also in the qualitative features of, of confabulation. Um, what, how did those confabulated memories look in comparison to real memories from the same time? Did they lack perceptual detail? Were they different in some ways? So we compared patient GS, who was a 46-year-old man who had an anterior communicating artery aneurysm rupture, and we compared him with three frontal lobe patients who did not confabulate, and then a group of non-impaired um, uh, uh, participants. And we looked at tasks of source memory. So we looked at his ability to, to tell you how long time intervals had been, to judge time duration, and we looked at temporal order. Could he say in terms of time sequence, what came before something else? And also looking at source memory, we looked at whether he could say which uh, person had said something. Why were we looking at source memory? Because there's an old theory of confabulation that confabulation and its talents theory, 
um, that confabulation, confabulated memories are true memories that are just not properly placed in the right time frame. So we wanted to see whether that was part of the problem for this particular patient. And then in terms of looking at the perceptual qualities of um, confabulations, we looked at the vividness of his memory for actual events versus imagined events. So here's the data on time um, duration. And you can see here that both frontal control patients and both um, and GS both underestimated time intervals going from 30 seconds to two minutes. And we did this in a variety of different ways. We, you know, we did it both asking him to mimic the time interval as well as state what the time interval was. Um, here's some data on um, temporal order. Could you say which came first when you presented someone with a series of faces, a series of sentences, words, and paintings? GF and his frontal lobe um, counterparts both did poorly in terms of their overall recognition, but um, frontal lobe patients had problems with temporal ordering more than GS did. So that did not seem explanatory in terms of his confabulation. We looked at um, his ability to say who had said a particular phrase, who had said a particular word. And just like other patients with frontal lobe damage, he had difficulty identifying the source of, of that particular type of information. And then we looked at qualitative features of his own memories, of his autobiographical memories. And these were rated by a number of blinded raters who worked, who were students at Yale working for Marsha Johnson at the time. So they assigned different perceptual codes to autobiographical reports. And you can see here that GS's, um, first of all, his response to, to um, cues was quite impaired. It was quite low. Um, and he, he never had very, very detailed autobiographical memories from the time frame of his confabulation. And so one idea that we had is perhaps in the context of having frontal lobe imagery, he was not able to clearly, clearly get to other autobiographical memories as a way of correcting um, his, his confabulation. And we also looked we did, we did something very tricky and that was kind of mean, which is that we had GS and the other frontal um, controls participate in a number of simulated tasks. We would have them imagine that they had tea with an Indian woman in a sari, and we would walk through this very long script and then see what did they remember. And you can see here that GS's memory for imagined events, those events that we sort of played with that we implanted for him was a little bit better than his memory for a real event that he experienced in our lab. Whereas for normal controls, it was about the same. And for other frontal controls, their memory for real events was a little bit better. And the last thing we did was we looked at his confabulation. And you can see here how very detailed his confabulation was. You know, this is not a true memory. This is how he explained why he was in the hospital. He said he was talking to his friend, Ed, who was seated in his truck. He fell backwards. He hit his head on the side of the road. This did not happen. He believes that um, it, Ed and his son were preparing to leave for an unknown destination. They took him to the house to lie down. They stayed for him with a while. for a while. Um, it all occurred at 7 p.m., um, after he had eaten supper, he had no doubt about the veracity of the event. He could see it in his mind's eye. He was taken to a particular hospital, then to another. Um, and then he described one hospital as older. So there are a few elements of this memory that were true, but by and large, it was not a true memory. So if you consider that GS had such a well-articulated confabulatory memory, and if you consider the fact that he has a propensity to remember imagined events as well as prior events, and that we showed that he has difficulty with source memory, both in terms of speaker identification and judging passing time, it gives you some explanation as to why he might be more prone to confabulation than other frontal lobe patients. And so we came to the conclusion that confabulation was 
based on a convergence of factors. One was source monitoring um, uh, deficits. He underestimated time. He had problems with speaker identification. He also, his own reservoir of autobiographical memories were somewhat, they lacked detail. They lacked perceptual clarity. So he couldn't, whoops, he couldn't correct himself. Um, and he had a propensity towards a detailed imagination. Um, his confabulation was equal to a real event from the same time when it was coded by those students um, at Yale. We came to the conclusion that any one of these factors alone may not produce confabulation, but interactions between them undermined his ability to discriminate between fact and fiction. Okay, I'm going to tell you about my last patient, and this is an older woman who had Capgras syndrome, who was followed in our amnesia research trials uh, for many years. And she just looked interesting. She just had a circumscribed amnesia until she fell from a pyramid and incurred damage to her right temporal lobe, and you can see her subdural hematoma there. Um, and she developed a Capgras illusion. And just to delusion, just to remind you what this is, it was a um, uh, term introduced by Capgras back in 1923 when he described a 53-year-old woman who complained that various doubles had taken the place of people she knew. She had lost four children over a brief time and only had one daughter. She thought that her children, she believed that her children were abducted and her daughter was replaced by a double. And he initially said that it was due to Oedipal issues. And we know that there are many, many explanations for Capgras syndrome. And some of these are psychodynamic. Some of them are in, uh, you know, influenced by Freudian thought. There was an idea that, it, uh, that Capgras syndrome was psychological regression to an earlier cognitive and emotional state, um, that someone has the feeling of depersonalization which they project onto others who are then experienced as imposters, that it could be the resolution of highly ambivalent feelings, a psychological double asks for acts as a target for unacceptable impulses. Um, and there does seem to be a role of emotions because it's the case that paranoia often precedes Capgras syndrome, whereas it is not prevalent in other reduplicative paramnestic syndromes. There are also cognitive models of Capgras syndrome, a disconnection between implicit and explicit face processing, a disconnection between face processing and memory, or an overall problem with self-awareness. What do we know about the pathological substrates? Well, we know that by and large, Capgras syndromes and other, other delusional misidentification syndromes emerge after right hemisphere or bifrontal lesions. And Feinberg has looked in a study in 2005, he found that 28 of 29 people with delusional misidentification syndrome had right hemisphere damage. And Ryan Darby and Shashank Prasad in 2018 did a meta-analysis of many studies, and they found that 92% of the people had right hemisphere lesions. And Hurstein and Ramachandran in 1997 came up with the idea that there was a disconnection between the fusiform face area and the amygdala. So this was a particularly interesting study looking at um, brain connectivity of lesions causing delusional misidentification. And this was the 2018 study that I just referred to. Um, they explored the idea that Capgras syndrome emerged from sites that had functional connections to a lesion. And in this study, they did something called lesion network mapping. So they looked at 17 cases of people who had delusional misidentification syndrome using a common brain atlas to identify those regions that were connected to the lesion site. And what did they found? In 17 of the 17 cases, the left retrosplenial cortex um, was um, implicated. And it's known that this is activated by a sense of familiarity. 
in functional imaging studies. So that makes sense. If you think about um, Capgras or other delusional misidentification syndromes, that their sense of familiarity is somehow abnormal. And in 16 of the 17 cases, there was damage in the right frontal cortex, which in neuroimaging studies is activated in terms of belief violation. So that makes sense. So you could think of a two-step dance then of some problem with familiarity and some problem with logic, giving rise to Capgras syndrome. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about, and this is just a slide that they, that they showed of these 17 cases. You can see the overwhelming evidence um, of right hemisphere damage um, in these patients. So the patient who I described with Nick Alexander and others was a 74 year old librarian. And we had seen her, I actually hadn't seen her, but some of my colleagues had for 10 years. She was in a, a research study and she looked the same. Initially, we thought she had Alzheimer's disease, but she just had a dense anterograde amnesia and it didn't really change. She was extremely smart. She went to an elite college. She had superior IQ and brain imaging way back when, it was CT scans at the time, didn't tell us much about her brain. There was nothing. Uh, there was no big lesion in her, in her medial temporal lobe. We didn't know um, what the etiology of her uh, amnesia was. We did know that she was well-adjusted. She had no psychiatric treatment, but she did have, and this is kind of key, and I'll ask you to revisit the idea that psychodynamics may play a role in the genesis of delusions or in the content of a delusion. She had been sexually molested by her father over the course of years, and we, we knew that that was the case because it had been um, investigated. So that, that was her remote history. But despite the amnesia, um, she had a very active lifestyle. She was painting, cooking, and traveling. And in fact, she traveled to Mexico uh, with her husband when she was amnestic, when she was 74 years old. And while she was climbing a pyramid, it wasn't this particular pyramid, but some sort of pyramid, she fell 40 feet and she lost consciousness um, for 20 minutes. And she developed a right temporal parietal hematoma as you saw in the CT scan that I showed you earlier. But relative, uh, relevant to our um, question about Capgras syndrome, she developed the delusion that her husband was her father. Her father had died 20 years prior. And as I told you, he had molested her as a child. And her delusion occurred every day and it persisted for hours. And she became extremely distressed and would call the police to remove her father, actually her husband, from her home. Um, she became childish, disinhibited, and impulsive. She couldn't maintain focused attention and couldn't think in a flexible way. So she had been amnesic for many years, very purposeful, very attentive. Then she had the head injury and developed the delusion and the executive deficits. So we had data that preceded and um, um, came after the development of Capgras syndrome. And there was a dramatic um, change in her executive functions during the period that she was delusional and no other change in other functions. We tried all sorts of interventions with her and none um, helped. So this is, you know, I didn't ask her, her husband to do this, but he kept a diary of the frequency and duration of her delusional behavior every day. So this is when we first saw her for testing in May of 1993. And she was having about over one and a half hours of delusions and it went up a little bit and it was very high. And you can see over the course of time as her brain healed in August of 1993, three months later, her delusions became much less frequent. They were still frequent, but not quite as dramatic. And during this time, we were able to test her. So these are the data from before her head injury, all of these data. So you see that she had a very high IQ, her, her ability to come up with words, she was not a phasic, her ability to perform the uh, Wisconsin card sort test was absolutely fine. Her naming on the Boston naming test was fine. Here's post head injury. So here's the period where I told you her delusions were peaking. 
she was not able to do the Stroop test. I, I don't know if you all know the Stroop test, but it's a test of frontal executive functions. She couldn't do the Wisconsin card sort test. She began making errors and, uh, and was slow on the trail making test. Um, and so you can see that there were frontal executive deficits at the time that she was delusional. And then as her delusion subsided, her um, abilities to, to perform frontal tasks was also much better. Um, her memory was impaired from day one. It didn't really change with the exception of more false positive errors following her head injury. She had some before her head injury, but even more following her head injury, consistent with the idea of frontal executive deficits. Um, I'm not, we also did an MMPI study with her, which I'm not going to go into detail because um, I want to leave time for questions. So what did we learn from this final patient who I'm telling you about? Well, you know, it underscored for us, and again, this is years before Brian Darby and Shashank Prasad's and also and, and um, Todd Feinberg's studies. We believe that there was a role of the right hemisphere in Capgras syndrome and delusional misidentification syndrome. We also noted that from a cognitive standpoint, that her executive deficits played a role. In the context of frontal lobe damage, there was reduced logic and acceptance, her ability to accept incongruous ideas. She was aware that her father was dead, but she believed that her father, her husband was her father. So she entertained those two ideas at the same time. She was also prone to behavioral and sexual uh, disinhibition which I believed influenced the content of her delusion. Her amnesia preceded um, her delusions, but it wasn't sufficient to cause the delusions, but it did make her vulnerable because she, just like patient GS, she did not have a reservoir of retrograde memories, of autobiographical memories that could serve to correct um, her ideas. And her history of sexual molestation was germane to the content of the delusion. She may have, in the same way that, um, I forget which um, psychoanalyst it was, uh, she may have had ambivalence about sexual feelings towards her husband and her father, uh, which gave rise to that particular um, delusion. Um, so I'm gonna stop there. I'm gonna open it up to questions. We don't have much time, but there's a little time if anyone does have any. Thank you, Margaret, for this amazing speech. And I think it's wonderful to hear about the single case studies, especially those days when we you know, are focused on the multi-center uh, database and all these huge numbers and, I don't know, increasing the numbers of patients when, when we really may lose very important data. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. I know I've told you a lot, so it's, sometimes it's hard to, to sort of get your head around it, but and, and if anyone does have any questions, you are free to contact me through Hannah, or you can ask them now if you have any. Yeah, so we will give you some time to think about your questions, and I would like to also say thank you very much for this uh, amazing uh, talk, Margaret. What I'm taking for, uh, from that is that uh, it is really uh, very essential to be a good observer in these patients mm -hmm. because I would say that, or what was seen from your talk is that uh, on one hand we have tests that uh, say something to us, but uh, when we do not observe everything in uh, into big detail, uh, then we may miss a very uh, essential information. Uh, and I think you also asked the patients about their problems, uh, which was also seen from your talk. I think it, was, it is a very essential part of that, isn't it so? I guess the take home message for me is just to, to trust your clinical intuition. Um, you know, even if it has some, you observe something that hasn't been described in the literature before, it, it may be real and it may, it may you know, you may find out later that that it's validated by other people. So these these just happen to be cases that, you know, years later there were studies. So it's interesting. Yes. Okay. <laughs>
Um, so um, Martin has asked for the 2018 paper. Oh, so the single case paper, I will send that to Hannah who can send that to you. Mm -hmm. Yes, for sure. It's a really interesting patient, a paper. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. Hi, Margaret. It was an uh, amazing talk. Uh, I have one question uh, when I am uh, listening uh, to to your uh, to your uh, to your speech and to uh, when, when you focus on the the single study patients, how you choose them, because you know um, it you you could. I, I some, sometimes I think that I can choose almost every patient what I have, <laughs> and yeah. I don't know if it's better to to choose the patient who is typical or who is really uh, not typical at all, or uh, which patient study longitudinal, longitudinally and which which uh, which uh, you know it's not necessary. So do you, do you have some some suggestions how to choose from all our patients the uh, the patients who are are good for a sing single case studies? That's a great question, Tomas. Um, you know, I, what I would say is that I feel like the patients sometimes choose us. Um, and some, some of the patients there um, were, you know, not so different, like patient SS who had the um, very dense anterograde amnesia uh, was not different. There's a lot of patients who have dense anterograde amnesia and retain a high IQ. At the time, you know, most of the other amnesic patients we were working with weren't quite as smart. So he gave us the ability to sort of look at, yeah, um, working memory in a, in a different way, in a more sophisticated way. Um, patient JT, who had the accelerated forgetting, was very unique, um, and was he chose us. You know, it was us trying to get our head around what is going on with this guy that led us to learn more about how the brain worked. And that was also true of patient LD, the woman who had the retrograde amnesia in the absence of anterograde. Um, so it, it's, it's kind of a two-step thing. So, you know, I saw a patient recently who had a cerebellar lesion and a big loss of, of autobiographical memory. And she, she would be someone who, she's a unique patient. I, I will probably follow up with her, um, but, by and large, the single case patients are unique patients. And there are now really good statistics um, to look at uh, for comparison uh, purposes at single case studies. I can't remember the name of the British statistician, um, but I know there is someone who does, um, who has promoted that. So both, I would say. There are some cases where um, a patient may seem run of the mill and you're investigating a particular idea a theory and, and they give you the ability to do that. Yeah. Thank you. It's, it's, okay. it's a great remark that the patient choose us. It's much better than, than <laughs> we choose them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway. Yeah, I was just wondering how, how difficult would it be today to publish some case studies, you know, because the, there are uh, I mean, it's great for us, for example, that we make some notes about our interesting patient just for it's, it's valuable for the educational purpose. And then sometimes we are presenting our case studies uh, for to our students or at some conferences. But uh, I was just wondering if there will be any chance to publish some case studies now, if you know, it, it's, I don't know, it would be, it, it has to be very unique patients like you no, have. They do have to be unique, and but there is a whole journal that's dedicated to that, to single case studies, and there's a professor at Harvard named Alfonso Caramazza, who is a big advocate of, of single case studies. So there's still a group of people who think mm -hmm. that it's a worthwhile pursuit, even though, you know, but it, I, I agree with you, it's more difficult in, in the era of big data. Oh, that's great information. I didn't know it, that there is a journal yeah. dedicated to this, because I think it's valuable also for the others just to share the interesting patients, even they won't be so special as you presented or unique. So, yeah. No, no, it's, it's, it's wonderful. There's also um, the INS has a newsletter 
that mm -hmm. has a section that I, I actually initiated called single case studies, where people in the patients aren't completely unique, but someone who has Moya Moya disease, someone, you know, a syndrome that you have, and, and, and people submit um, cases that are, are well described. So, yeah, I think there, there are ways. I mean, that's not a peer reviewed publication, but it's still a, a place to. Yeah, discuss with colleagues. Very yeah. important. It's similar like present the negative results, right? <laughs> <It's>... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I have also a question. Uh, mm -hmm. I would like to ask Margaret, when did you actually come up uh, with the fact that the patient himself is really unique? Was it uh, during the time you assessed him or you were in contact with him or actually a few years uh, afterwards when you saw another patient who was similar to him? If you so, know um, there, so the unique patient, um, the, th the three unique patients that I described um, were the accelerated forgetting. And I knew he, I had never seen mm -hmm. someone who lost memory. And I'd seen a lot of amnesic patients at that point. So it was when I was testing JT that I thought his rate of forgetting is really weird. It's really different. Um, and when um, the woman EB developed cap grass delusions, I, you know, we had seen her for years. So it was when I was seeing those two the patient SS, who was such a you know smart man, was not, not really unique besides the fact that he was so smart. And he was just, he's been cited, or at least he's not cited anymore. But in the 1990s and 1980s, he was at, you know, one of these amnesic patients who people would, would often cite and say, working memory studies of SS. So that made me know that he had he had contributed a lot to our understanding of memory. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. mm -hmm. so actually both, if I understand. Both, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'm thinking about one of our patients uh, who we were wondering about uh, his diagnosis and uh, we, uh, we saw him uh, through a few years and actually after, I would say, more than five years, we came uh, with the actual diagnosis but it was not evident from the beginning and he was really unique and a little bit weird and mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> so maybe he's worthwhile thinking more about and discussing more yeah yeah okay well thank you again for inviting me it's great to to see you um all and um i will send that paper to hannah Okay. Thank All you, right. Margaret. So All nice. right. Okay. Bye bye, Thank everyone. You, Margaret. Okay. Nice to see you. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye bye.